Well, if your Bibles are not open there, if you turn to Job 20, Job 20 and 21, we will go through this tonight. And the theme of this is don't miss the point or the, the patience, perhaps the impatience of Job. Several people have asked me in the last couple of weeks about what do we do with J- James 5.11 where James writes, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And several have asked me about where do we see the patience of Job? Because particularly in verse 4 of chapter 21, Job says, As for me is my complaint against man, why should I not be not patient but impatient? Where do we see the compassion in the mercy of God? Well, we'll look at the compassion and mercy of God later on, but I want to suggest to you that we do see in the book of Job his patience by the fact that he is actually enduring his friends. Uh, The way that they are treating him, uh, he is showing great patience. But more to the point, he is pursuing God. He is persevering. Uh, nowhere in the book of Job does he ask God to deliver him from his trials. What he's asking for is to be right with God. He's just dumbfounded about why he's going through what he's going through. And so we see throughout the book of Job that he perseveres. One author said that even though Job complains about God, he never gives up on God. He keeps going after him. And remember Satan was tempting him to curse God. He never does that. So we do see Job's patience. Job persevered because Job longed to be right with God. And that's the point behind all of his perseverance. He wasn't so much looking for a change of circumstances. He was looking for a connection with God. He wanted to make sure, he wanted to know that God had not rejected him. He's feeling that way. And so his friends come with all this simplistic theoretical system, and it all amounts, as he says, at the end of chapter 1, to empty nothings. Tonight we're going to be looking at that under two broad headings. In chapter 20, we have Zophar's final speech. I was reading this week about Jonathan Edwards, an 18th century preacher in America, a great theological mind, a great revival broke out under his ministry, and he preached a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, in chapter 20, we see a saint in the hands of an angry counselor. Zophar is not a happy camper. He speaks in verse 2, Therefore my thoughts answer me because of my haste within me. I hear censure that insults me, and out of my understanding, a spirit answers me. He's irked because of what Job has said in chapter 19. If you say how we pursue him, and the root of the matter is found in him, be afraid of the sword. He's speaking to his friends. For the wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is a judgment. And Job finished chapter 19 saying that his friends were going to be under the judgment of God, which, by the way, they were in chapter 42. So Zophar is quite upset about that. He is uh, extremely agitated, and frenzy drives Zophar back into the fray, and he opens his mouth, and he's going to speak some harsh words, but, by the way, true words. It's really a really good sermon on the wrath of God. Factually, it is correct, but it is, like so many of these chapters, misapplied. In verses 4 to 29, we see Zophar, he is adamant. He is adamant that the wicked will suffer, and his implication is that they will suffer in this life. He speaks about the fact that they're under God's wrath and that their fame is fleeting in verses 4 to 11. He says, do you not know this from of old since man was placed on the earth? In other words, Job, where have you been? Aren't you paying attention? Everybody knows that the exalting of the wicked is short and the joy of the godless but for a moment. 
Well, of course, Job, if he had answered at this point, would have said, actually, I don't know that. And we'll see in the next chapter that Job's going to refute that. That the, that the reality is sometimes the wicked do prosper. Though his height mount up to the heavens and his head reach to the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. In other words, the wicked are just going to go down the sewer. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and not be found. He will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place any more behold him. His children will seek the favor of the poor, and his hands will give back his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. In other words, the wicked will not prosper. They will be judged, and they'll be judged in this lifetime. There's a lot of truth in this, but it's not a carte blanche truth, as we'll see in a moment. He speaks in verses 12 to 19 and says that the folly of the wicked is futile. And keep in mind, as we're reading these verses, that in Zophar's mind, Job is amongst the wicked. Though the evil is sweet in his mouth, though he hides it under his tongue, though he is loath to let it go and holds it in his mouth, yet his food is turned in his stomach. It is the venom of cobras within him. He swallows down riches and vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. In other words, Job, you have been chewing on sin secretly, but it is now being spewed forth publicly. We know that you are wicked. You've been chewing on evil. Now it is all coming home. That indeed your sin, Job, has found you out. In verses 20 to 29, he speaks about the, the fullness of the wicked being fuel for God's wrath. Because he knew no contentment in his belly, he would not let anything in which he delights escape him. There was nothing left after he had eaten. Therefore, his prosperity will not endure. In the fullness of his sufficiency, he will be in distress. The hand of everyone in misery will come against him to fill his belly to the full God will send his burning anger against him and rain it upon him into his what? Body. In other words, in this life. Job, Zophar says, going back to the early, the opening of this, everybody knows this. Everybody since the fall, everybody since Adam and Eve, everybody since the first family knows that the wicked will not prosper, that their joy will be short-lived, that even in this life, they are, going to be, they are going to suffer. If he tries to flee, in verse 24, from an iron weapon, a bronze arrow will strike him through. It's drawn forth and comes out of his body. The glittering point comes out of his gallbladder. And I read that this week and thought, ouch. <laughs> and for any self-righteous Zophars here, I don't think that's why I had a gallbladder problem. Terrors come upon him. Utter darkness is laid up for his treasures. A fire not fanned will devour him. What is left in his tent will be consumed. The heavens will reveal his iniquity and the earth will rise up against him. The possessions of his house will be carried away. Stuart drew our attention to that. Dragged off in the day of God's wrath. This is the wicked man's portion from God. The heritage decreed for him by God. And Job, since you are suffering, you are amongst the wicked. They say that when Jonathan Edwards, in fact, I studied that in secular university, his sermon. Uh, it's considered one of the greatest pieces of English literature in the United States history. And they say that when Jonathan Edwards preached that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that he actually read the manuscript holding a candle. So there is no theatrics. But as he preached that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God, they said the people were actually were grabbing onto the pews and, and, and their knuckles were turning white. They were so fearful of God's wrath. Well, I want to suggest to you that Zophar's sermon is really a good sermon about God's wrath. The only thing that I would fault in this sermon, if I was sitting there with a, in, in, in homiletics class and had to critique this, would be that he is assuming that God always judges the wicked in this life. 
But there's no doubt that God brings his wrath upon those who do not serve him. God does bring eventually his wrath upon the godless. The issue here is not that what Zophar is necessarily saying is untrue. It is just terribly, terribly misapplied. Anton, Anton said something a couple weeks ago, which I thought was really helpful. He talked about the word of God being a sword, a double-edged sword. And I'm paraphrasing perhaps, but he said that, that a, sword, a double-edged sword is, uh, is very effective, but if it's not handled accurately, it can be very, very dangerous. Well, so it is with biblical truth. What Zophar is saying, there's so much here that we would amen. There's so much here that is true, but he is handling God's word, God's truth, irresponsibly. And he's handling it irresponsibly because he has no category for the righteous suffering, which is also a biblical truth. He is handling it irresponsibly because he has no category for God's inscrutable wisdom. He has no category for assuming the best. He's looking at circumstances and drawing conclusions. And I have said this repeatedly, and I will continue to repeat this, that when we are helping those who are afflicted, we need to be very, very careful we don't jump to conclusions. We need to be very, very careful that we wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, in a responsible way. The Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered so many of the things that Zophar has mentioned here, he suffered those things, but he was perfectly righteous. People made wrong assessments about him because of his circumstances. But we know he was sinless. So Zophar has, by the way, this is the last time we hear from Zophar, and I would just say mercifully it's the last time we hear from him. As one commentator said, we will not miss him. In chapter 21, Job responds, and I've called this, this chapter Job's frustrated speech. He's annoyed. Then Job answered and said, keep listening to my words. He's begging them to listen. Let this be your comfort. Bear with me. Keep listening, in other words, and I will speak. And after I have spoken, mock on. In other words, Job doesn't actually expect these friends to listen to him, but he's appealing to them, please listen to me. You've jumped to all kinds of conclusions. I'm begging you to listen to me. You probably won't, and when you're done, you can just keep on mocking. He's annoyed with them, and he is impatient with God. In verse 4, we have Job, who, and through verse 26, he's, he's appalled at what has happened. As for me, is my complaint against man? My complaint is not against you. Why should I not be impatient? Why is that? Because he is, his, his complaint is against God. You say, it sounds terrible. No, no, now we understand the context. His complaint is against God because he doesn't understand what is happening. Keep in mind, we're, as a reader, we know all of this, right? Thank, Tommy knows this, okay? All right, we know this. But Job, he doesn't know all that's happening. He says, look at me, look at me, listen to me, and, and look at me. You're, you're spewing forth all this condemnation. Take a good look at me and be appalled. And by the way, can I just say this? He didn't have social media, media in mind here. But there is something about having a dialogue face-to-face -face with people that makes a difference how you respond to them. So many cowards and cruel people hide behind keyboards. Job said, listen to me and look at me and be appalled. Lay your hand over your mouth. In other words, shut up and listen and look at me. Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow in mighty power? And everything Job's going to say here in this chapter is basically two things. I under, he said, you, you said that everybody knows since Adam and Eve that the wicked suffer and they suffer in this life. He says, I don't buy that. He said, look around. Oftentimes, the wicked prosper. 
And secondly, he says, I look around and the wicked oftentimes are not punished. He says, their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. It's a beautiful picture. Here's this wicked person, this godless person, and their house is full of children and grandchildren. Their houses are safe from fear and there's no rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without fail. There's great productivity. Their cow calves and does not miscarry. They send out their little boys like a flock and their children dance. This is a happy scene, isn't it? And this is the wicked. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. They spend their days in prosperity and in peace they go down to Sheol. And meanwhile, he says, they say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Behold, is not their prosperity in their hand? The counsel of the wicked is far from me. Job's saying here, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Because here's the people who are saying, God, you're not in our thoughts. We have no use for you. And yet God seems to have them in his thoughts positively. I mean, all you have to do is look around Africa in the history of so many of our countries. Look at, look at the, so many of our corrupt leaders who prospered. We see the wicked prospering. Job, perhaps in some ways, is overstating the case, but not completely. He's saying, I look around. He said, you know, Zophar, you're saying the w- wicked are judged, but actually, if you would pay attention, so many times the wicked prosper. If your argument is that the wicked are judged... I'm telling you that the wicked prosper, so actually your argument falls flat. He says in verse 17, he speaks about the fact that the wicked do not, are not punished. How often is it that the lamp of the wicked is put out, that their calamity comes upon them? That God distributes pains in his anger. He says, look around. Look at the wicked. I don't see the wicked being punished in this life. They're like straw before the wind and like chaff that the storm carries away. He says, I don't see that happening. You say God stores up their iniquity for their children. Well, Job says that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem very just. Big deal if it's stored up for their children. They're not going to be around. He says, let him pay it out to them and that they may know it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For do they care for their houses after them when the number of their months is cut off? When they're dead, they don't care what happens to their family after they're gone. How's that just? Here in verse 22, it seems to me that Job is actually now rebuking his friends. And he kind of is defending God. And this is where this perseverance, he keeps coming back to trust in God. Will any teach God knowledge, seeing that he judges those who are on high? And here's what he's going to say. He says, one dies in his full vigor, being wholly at ease and secure, his pail is full of milk. That speaks of, a, of an older person who still has marrow in their bones. Someone over 80. Another dies in bitterness of soul, never having tasted of prosperity. In other words, he's saying, I'm not arguing that people die. But there, there, he said the issue is when they lie down alike in the dust and the worms cover them, The worms eat the poor and the prosperous, they make no distinction. He says to his friends in this final diatribe against them, Behold, I know your thoughts and your schemes to wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince? Where is the tent in which the wicked live? I know what you're thinking, he says. You're saying, okay, bring forth some evidence. Where's the house of the wicked prince, and where is the tent in which the wicked live? Have you not asked those who travel the roads? I love what Job's saying here. You said earlier, Zophar, that don't I know anything? Don't I know human history since the fall? That everybody knows that the wicked are judged in this life? Well, he says to them, you don't know much. Ask someone who's traveled around a bit. Ask those who travel the roads and do not accept their testimony that the evil man is spared in the day of calamity, that he is rescued in the day of wrath. In other words, ask those who have traveled around. There are many, many people, wicked people, who prosper. He declares his way to his face and who pays him for what he has done. When he is carried to the grave, watch is kept over his tomb. Even in their death, he says, 
The wicked oftentimes are honored. The clods of the valley are sweet to him. All mankind follows after him, and those who go before him are innumerable. How then will you comfort me with empty nothings? There's nothing left of your answers but falsehood. I've read lots of biographies of lots of different kinds of people, including some wicked leaders, and it's amazing. Whether it be Mao, whether it be Lenin, whether it be Stalin, they die and there's big funerals. They're honored in their life, they're honored in their death, at least for a while. Job is saying, in a nutshell, Zophar, you're missing the point completely. Well, what is the point? It's interesting when you look at this, and please pay heed, and I promise I'll be done. When you look at Zophar's speech, like most of the speeches, there is something hugely missing here. In Zophar's speech, it is all condemnation. There is no offer of hope. There is no offer of mercy. There is no call to repentance. It's Job, you're wicked. And you are receiving your just due. It is hopeless. And it's all based upon the fact that Job has lost his prosperity. Job then argues and says, your argument is faulty because actually so many people who are wicked do prosper in this life. For Job, it was never, ever about prospering in this life it was, it was all about being right with God. The other day, after my procedure, I woke up in the theater uh, waiting room, and there was a nurse there, and we began to talk. And I asked her, I said, are you a believer? And she said, yes. She said, in 2017, she said, I was an alcoholic. And she said, she actually was scheduled to have a liver replacement. She said, and God miraculously delivered me from that. And anyway, he saved me. And as we were talking about some things, we were talking about the fact, how do people go through trials like that without the Lord? And then later on, I started thinking, actually, lots of people go through trials just fine without the Lord. Lots of people go through affliction just fine without him. They're happy. They got good families, and things seem to go just fine. But that's not the point. The point is knowing the Lord. You know, when, when, when Jesus suffered, we're told in Hebrews 12 that he, as, as he suffered, he endured the pain, he endured the suffering of the cross Doing what? He endured that joy looking for the Father. When Jesus was on the cross, he didn't say, my God, my God, why am I in so much pain? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for Jesus, it was never about prospering. It was about knowing of the fellowship with the Father. And as we are counseling those who are undergoing inexplicable affliction, we need to keep before us that God may never deliver them from their pain. He may never deliver them from their affliction. He may never deliver them from their horrible marriage. What he wants to do is deliver them to himself so that they have an abiding, deep relationship with him. We know in the end that works out for Job. And in that sense, we see the goodness and the compassion of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your grace to us, your mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would help us to seek him above all things Whatever our affliction is, Lord, may we please look to Christ in order to seek you first and help us to prioritize that relationship above 
any possible earthly prosperity. Help us not to miss the point of why you have saved us. Help us not to miss the point of why we are here on earth. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.